<laughs> Hello, and welcome to the Dissident Mama podcast, episode number 25. Today, my guest is Jennifer Grinwis, owner of Nan School of Dance, which was started by Grinwis's mother, Nan, in 1975. Jen became director in 2002, and she and her husband, John, have owned the company since 2008. The dance studio has two North Carolina locations, Greensboro and Yadkinville. It's a family business with deep roots, so Jen, who is also a homeschool mom of four, is going to talk with us today about the North Carolina lockdowns and how it has affected she and John's livelihood. Welcome, Jen. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you, dear. I think yeah. I need to give a disclaimer from the beginning. I guess I don't call most of my de guests dear from the very beginning, but Jen and I are <laughs> friends. <laughs> That is right. I count you as one of my friends for sure. <laughs> She's kind of a rabble rouser, but that doesn't mean if she starts to go off the rails, you know, getting off the reservation somehow, I will pull her back in. I will put on my journalism hat and pull her back in. So um, I think we're just going to talk to her because um, small business seems to be among so many pieces of collateral damage just left in the wake of these policies that make to me, very little, if no economic, scientific, or ethical sense. So I want to see what's happening to a business like yours. I, I kind of count them, not that your business is dead, but among these deaths of despair we, we hear people talking about, um, you know, the toll that these policies are taking really doesn't make it into mainstream news. Um, you know, I don't, follow a lot of mainstream news, but I kind of poked around it today to see what, you know, Waypo was saying in the New York Times. And yeah, know, they really just don't kind of talk about it that much. So um, they're talking about case numbers and spikes and masks and all that kind of stuff. So I want you to just kind of tell me, give us like your, your intro and then we'll tease it all out. But what this insanity has been like for you and your family as, you know, business owners and um, running a family business with two North Carolina locations and two different counties, right? Yeah, and that's a very interesting point. Um, the two counties are very different. Okay. Um, but I will say, first of all, rinse that stereotype from your mind of like dance moms. Oh, I run a dance studio. Um, our business is family friendly and we um, diligently have role models <laughs> as our teachers. And we are really trying to um, not just teach steps, teach life lessons to these kids as they're coming through our program so that they can be confident citizens in the world when they leave us, when they fly the coop. So um, we, it's been hard uh, and it's been a juggling act from the very beginning. We lost five employees right off the bat back in actually January, uh, February, March. And so um, having that, to pick up this. Was that COVID related? Like were um, they getting not, sick? You know, most of it was honorable. I need to spend more time with my family reasons. Okay. And but it just coincided, okay. you know? So it just made it exponentially harder because of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we, right from the very beginning, had to learn all these new things and reimagine how to give the best service to our customers. So we learned how to Zoom and how to do that best. And we learned how to put all our choreography on YouTube and keep it private and send it just to the classes that needed it. and make everybody feel safe and secure um not only from the virus but also in their in our online presence and because there was all these questions about safety of zoom and exposure on youtube you know so that what, was like part of like privacy and stuff yeah privacy and okay. like hackers coming into the zoom classes and they're oh. watching all the little kids right. you know um so dealing with that and relearning well not relearning learning from the beginning from scratch i mean i'm an old dog i don't like new tricks <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> so that was hard um but we got through that and we started with cooper's executive order 120 
that was March 23rd. Okay. And um, that's when you put all the people limits on everything, outdoor, indoor, what you can do, where. And now we are currently on executive order 181. Okay. So I have, you know, you got to keep up. So it's all the time. When's he having a press conference? When's, you know, Dr. Cohen going to talk about this? And when is this official? Is it really in the executive order? What loopholes is in this new one that we can use um, just in case? So it was always um, a trick to keep up with what the governor was throwing at us, you know? Yeah. So back in March, you know, the original mandate, two weeks flatten the curve, were you closed for two weeks because everybody, nobody knew what was going on? Or were you just instantly like, well, I guess we'll do Zoom. I mean, did we, you close? And then what happened after that? It coincided with spring break. So okay. really that was perfect for us. And we were closed for that week. And that's when we put all the classes on Zoom. And so that next week of the two weeks to flatten the curve, mm -hmm. we could be on Zoom with our kids and not miss any tuition payments. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So how long did you do the Zoom? Are you still doing that? Um, how far have we gotten from that era of, you know, everybody staying away to, oh, just slap on a mask and, you know, breathe in your carbon dioxide while you're right. doing your plies or whatever they're called. <laughs> right. Yeah, you got it. Plies. Yeah. <laughs> plies. Um, well, we did Zoom through April and then recital was coming up, right? So mm -hmm. we knew the kids were not going to be prepared. Zoom is not effective teaching tool. It's just not. Mm -hmm. So we knew that they were not going to be prepared for recital if we kept doing that. So then we started doing simultane simultaneous in-person and Zoom lessons. So the kids, the families who didn't want to be there in person could stay on Zoom. And the ones who did want to come came in person and we just did them at the same time. Now, that being said, um, our communiques with our parents dance parents were always with peppered with um phrases like individual rights and signed your freedom loving dance studio owners john and jen <laughs> so awesome. people knew kind of where we stood um and we were i mean we never wanted to be reckless of course so we're doing what the governor says, but then also constantly trying to find ways to operate loopholes in his mandates so that we could get the kids in there. Um, and I told them in April, I promised these kids a recital and they've practiced for it. They've got the costumes for it. They're excited for it. And everybody knows, I mean, the kids have been suffering through this from the get-go. And it's only gotten worse. Mm -hmm. um, and I told the parents back then, I'm not breaking my promise to these kids. We're going to have it um, no matter how it ends up being. And I had to reimagine the whole thing. Logistics-wise, we usually have it at a local college. We've been doing that for 30 years. Wow. Um, yeah, the same place, the same people. We're like family there once a year. Um, but their board voted, nope, we couldn't have it there. So I ended up doing it from scratch, outdoors, under a tent, rented the stage, rented the music equipment, rented the lights, did every, restructured the whole thing so that we could have rotating crowds of smaller numbers and the people be there for a shorter period of time, and we just did a big marathon all day. Wow. Um, and it worked out great. But a lot of studios in North Carolina didn't get that opportunity because of the mandates. And recital revenue for dance studios is critical to get you to your next year because you don't have summer tuition. Okay. So, and you're still paying rent. 
So most studios kind of like people live paycheck to paycheck mm -hmm. dance studios, lots of times run year to year and that, and they don't have any extra left over that recital revenue gets them through the summer until they can start tuition drafts and payments again in September. Okay. So, so there was a lot of dance studio closure in North Carolina because of not being able to do recitals. And think of it this way too. Like if I had not been able to do a recital that would have affected the florist that does all the flowers, the photographer that does all the pictures, the videographer that does all the videos, um, my printer that does the programs and all the signage. I mean, I build a brand mm -hmm. for every year for the show. Um, and those are all small businesses too. The costume company, lots of these people, um, I get my costumes American made. They come out of Pennsylvania and they're still feeling the effects of not having as many studios order from them. And then also being in lockdowns themselves, they couldn't sew anything but PPE for months. Hmm. It's crazy. So it has a, everything connected in mm -hmm. our interest industry has taken a huge hit. Oh, I mean, one of my questions was going to be uh, how you dealt with it, not just as a business owner, but as a mom and a Christian, um, you know, you've alluded to some of that, that, you know, you see these kids who are suffering. And to me, the more I live through this, the more I study it, I'm seeing it in my opinion, as a war on children that, right. Like, I think that is, may not be the ultimate pinnacle of this, you know, but it's definitely up there near the top. Um, right. You know, what were some other concerns like that? You know, I mean, you're just a, you're a very ethical business owner, but anything like that where you felt like you were having to, you know, somehow, I don't know, uh, do things you didn't want to do because you were trying to, you know, navigate this insanity that's constantly changing too anything like that, that, um, you know, made you second guess the way you pr were proceeding with things? Um, I'm trying to think like ethically, once the mask mandates started happening, um, I felt like, well, obviously a parent is the ultimate authority over their child's health. That is not my place. And I, it will never be my place. I'm never going to, you know, I'm not in the business of suffocating children. When their parent says they can come in and they're making an individual decision about the rights of their health, they are perfectly welcome to come into my business without a mask because that they're deciding for their own health. I, I would never, um, you know, push that on anybody. And we told people that we said, you there's going to be people in here without masks because I'm not going to mask them up if they come in without it. Now, a lot of people knew that once the mayor of Greensboro set up her penalty system, um, some people were concerned about me getting in trouble right. if they didn't put a mask on their kid. And I was like, look, y'all, you don't need to worry about me. This is your child we are talking about. I, don't be, Mayor Nancy is not going to see any of my money, regardless of who comes, if they try to come in here and lock the door and count heads and say, $100, $100, $100, no mask, no mask, no mask. No, they're, they're not going to see any of our money. <laughs> you and know? You're, you're referring to Greensboro Mayor Nancy Vaughn. And, um, so Cooper's most recent mandate, if I'm not correct, please, you follow these mandates much closer than I, because I don't, I'm the one going into the businesses going, do I put them at risk? Do I not? You know, I usually just go unmasked into most places and just don't make eye contact with people. That's kind yeah, of my, yeah. that's my shtick. I wore, oh, no. a I wore a body cam for a while, but that just got tedious. But anyway, um, so the Co D Cooper, uh, Governor Cooper of North Carolina, it's a thousand dollars now, only if it's enforced. And then Mayor Nancy Vaughn, it's a hundred per unmasked person. Is that what the deal is? Explain it to us. Right. Okay. So on the Friday before Thanksgiving, Mayor Nancy Vaughn in Greensboro, North Carolina, 
mandated that whenever you leave your house, you have to put a mask on and you businesses, she appointed, I don't know what she calls them, COVID task force enforcers that um, can go into businesses that have been complained against mm -hmm. and they can lock the door and count faces in there and whoever doesn't have a mask on that's over five years old you get a hundred dollar fine per unmasked face you do or the citizen the business the business okay uh-huh uh-huh um and then the monday after she made that mandate cooper came out with executive order 180 and in that one he also said if you when you leave your house you have to have a mask on it doesn't matter there are zero exceptions to this rule anymore okay but in let's see how many days later on the 8th of december he changed his exception rule and put back in there's an exception to wearing a mask if you are strenuously exercising and you have trouble breathing dizziness or lightheadedness so now we have that little loophole because of course i'm dancing yes i'm having trouble breathing yes i'm dizzy yes i'm lightheaded <laughs> when i have that thing on so it's coming off <laughs> right <laughs> yeah, and the same people who, you know, think carbon di you know, are constantly calling carbon dioxide, I can't even say, it, constantly calling carbon dioxide a toxin, you know, for their crazy, you know, environmental plans. One is breathing it in all the time. I'm like, you can't have it both ways with that. <laughs> right, right. <sighs> well, tell yeah. me. Logical people are not okay. <laughs> I know, I know, my goodness, logic. Oh, it's a tool of the patriarchy, right? That's what, that's why they oh. say that. <laughs> so let, let's go off on this Greensboro kind of Nancy Vaughn thing for a second. And then I want to get kind of like go back out to statewide. And then, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you is I'd kind of been, you know, following what was going on with you, but you were like always the person I was thinking about because I know you locally. I know that, you know, dancing, you know, can't dance with a mask on. So I just finally got you on, but you know, I, I want to talk, I want people to see you're a real person and this is what is going on to you. Now, granted, most of the people that watch my podcasts, you know, are already team players. They're already our compatriots, but right. if you can wake one person up to realize what you're trying to go through. Um, that's kind of what I want to get to uh, after we kind yeah. of go off on Nancy Vaughn for a second. So this is a reason I don't really go into Greensboro <laughs> anymore, but she created a snitch list basically is what it is. Yeah. It's anonymous. And why don't you describe what, how you see it and if it has affected you? I think you said it had, but tell us what that's like. How, um, right. 1984 is that? It, it totally is. Um, it's a little surreal because only, let's see, three days after she made that mandate the Friday before Thanksgiving, we got a visit at the studio from the fire department and the fire department came in and said, there's been a complaint against your business. My employee asked him, what was it for? And he said, I don't know. So he hands us a list that says, here are all the ways to be compliant in Greensboro with the COVID rules. And that's all that I've come here to do today. Well, then, uh, let's see, two weeks later, we get a visit from one of the COVID, city COVID task force enforcers. And this is after, mm, timeline, yeah, timeline wise, after that first visit from the fire department, Nancy Vaughn released the list of wrongdoers that had had complaints anonymously filed against them. <laughs> unsubstantiated, yeah. uninvestigated, uncorroborated complaints. She released this to the local TV station mm -hmm. 
CBS, the WFMY2, mm -hmm. and they published it on their website. They um, also put it up on their Facebook page with the hotline number yeah. for other snitches to call in on other businesses and add some more to the list. Um, so people have still been calling on us and we got other visits um, subsequently. One from the COVID task force enforcer. And yet again, he was not even informed of what the complaint was so that we could fix it. He just handed us a list. Here you go, here's, here's the whole list. And then the next day we got another visit from the cops. She's having cops come hand businesses a piece of paper because they're getting anonymous complaints on a hotline she set up. When I'm, I think my taxpayer dollars should be having those cops patrolling over there where there's uh, 60 murders this year, mm -hmm. you know, money better spent. Do you think she's sending, I mean, the cops obviously can be intimidating, but like a fireman, because it's, is that just a guy in a uniform who seems official? Is she just trying to intimidate people? Maybe, but because the people that have been there personally are kind they don't want to be doing this. They know it's a waste of their time too. Mm -hmm. And they are not given full information before they even show up there. They have nothing to go on except right. this. They got to hand you this piece of paper. It's a complete waste of time. Yeah. And the snitch list, just as a, you know, a journalist, uh, I mean, the journalistic, uh, I guess like malpractice or malfeasance, I guess may be the better word is insane you know yes. just anybody could call i mean this literally is soviet because that's how sometimes you got rid of your neighbor you didn't like you just said hey yeah. um, he's doing this thing and he said uh lennon was a big fat jerk and then you know bob yeah. your neighbor who annoys you or vlad whatever he's gone uh -huh. forever i mean it's very right what if it's my competitor down the street yes. i mean in greensboro there's a dance studio on every other corner mm -hmm. it could be a competitor calling and wanting my business you know my kids we're operating at about 60 percent what we really should be in enrollment right now so okay. we're already um you know down of course right. we're celebrating what we have um because it could be worse but who knows if that snitcher is a competitor because i know it's not just my dance studio that's down by 40%. Everybody else is too. And, right. and they're desperate. Yeah. Yeah. I guess you see them. You would think they'd be on your team, but you know, they're hedging their bets. Like one day we'll be normal again, which I question that, but you know, Oh, I'll just play by the rules and then I'll be the only man left standing. I mean, yeah, yeah. that's, that's frightening to think about that. Cause you think of like small business owners would be rallying together. Um, right. So it's hard enough to, you know, run a small business before all this, pay your bills, pay your employees, and still make a profit when you meet all the certifications and all the licensure and insurance and all that stuff. Uh, yes. Do you, I'll probably know the answer to this, probably a good setup for you, but do you think this is partially a war on small business? Um, maybe inadvertently, uh, maybe not inadvertently, um, because we are, uncontrollable it must be maddening to the machine that we are independent and making our own decisions and are not um you know privy and following along good little robots to the narrative you know mm -hmm. so yeah it feels like it it feels yeah. like it's a war on us yeah because you know, I, I think about when I do my shopping, uh, I do go to a few stores and, you know, some of them are more local than others, but I think because I'm not going to go in masked, you know, who could handle the, um, the, whatever, the, the fine, if I go in, you know, pr pr sometimes I stay away from small businesses. I want to give them money, but I don't want to get them in trouble where I'm like, oh, well, this big box store, I don't care, you know? So sometimes uh -huh. I... I it's making me a weird shopper, you know, but 
you had said earlier in um, some of our correspondence that uh, a silver lining of this was something, and it kind of has to do with purging out a uh, certain, <laughs> purge might be a strong word. Um, just tell us what that silver lining was. You would say yeah. it better than me. <laughs> well, I really think um, the, we've kind of culled the part of the population that would be afraid, that would be a complainer. Um, because our, our vocabulary from the beginning was, we're going to push through this. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to be intimidated and you're going to have freedom to decide for yourself what you want to do for you and your family. Mm -hmm. And so now we have a really strong, loyal customer base that has stuck with us and are behind us in every way. It's really, um, it's really a beautiful thing. <laughs> uh, and I, and I didn't, it's a it's a nice result um so i think i wish more small business owners would would use their words like that and really yeah. really let people um let people have their rights and not dictate to them and people will come people will come and right. they will support you and they will back you up when things get bad and they will um Thank you personally for, I mean, I've had so many parents say, you guys are the only place we can come. And my kid looks forward to it. They know this is the place where joy happens because it, it doesn't anywhere else these mm -hmm. days. And um, the kids have suffered enough. So we want to be the place where they can come and relieve all that stress and tension that is built up. And parents can see when they leave with smiles on their faces, um, it really makes a difference in their lives. Yeah, I have a few oases of uh, normalcy in my life. Um, uh, a parish I'm going to, my homeschool co-op, um, a, a few other places, but you know, I get to the point where I can't even like say where they are and who's involved in them. I mean, it feels like super underground, you know, it's very bizarre. Uh -huh. So the, the people who are sticking with you, you've culled, that's better than purge. You've culled the Karens, right? You know, yeah. they've just kind of, but have any of them, I mean, Karens, once they bite into something, I mean, busybody is just busybody. It's like how they exist it, it is the meaning of their life. I mean, are they going out of the, I mean, besides the snitch list, I guess you'll never know, but have they been super ugly to you or done anything like that? Or they have just kind of left angrily? Um, yeah, most, uh, most people actually left in the spring before recital. Um, and they left amenably. They would say, Hey, I, this just didn't go in the way I want it to go. I'm sorry. Right. It's got to be like this, but we'll see you when we see you. Right. Um, so most people aren't ugly about it. I do get some nasty emails and like book length nasty emails, you know. Um, but I just kill them with kindness. You know, what else can you do? And they're going to, I let them make their own decision. Right. <laughs> and I'm going to, and I tell them, I'm going to let everybody else make their own right. decision. <laughs> Now, is it specifically that mask or not to mask that's your personal decision? Is that the crux of it or is it your language too? I mean, or is it just everything? It's mostly over masks and capacity. Okay. Yeah. Um, spacing, you know, trying to keep everybody spaced out, uh, which we're doing, you know, we've got the floor marked, we've got the signage up and, um, since May, we've been in person. We've been, um, I have a great spray that I spray in between every single class <laughs> and good. it's worked. I mean, yeah. it's successful and yeah. we're, um, we're making it happen and it's going to keep happening. Yeah. Well, I want to talk a little bit about what I see as anti, the anti-small business climate. Um, so 
you know, it wasn't just the mandates. The spring also gave us those glorious, peaceful, justice-filled riots, right? You know, and the whole <laughs> thing, <laughs> it was just, it was beautiful. Um, yeah. But the whole thing, as mob and pop businesses are burning down and being destroyed, oh, they have insurance. Oh, they have insurance. I want you to give people like us who have no clue what it takes to own a business, much less a brick and mortar businesses, two of them, mm -hmm. what, it, what it means to you, you know, the memories, the sentimentality, the pride, um, let, give us a peek into what that means because that is so often poo-pooed. It's just a building. It's just stuff. It's just matter. Burn it down. My kids and I are reading four in Fahrenheit 451 right now, and there's even a speech about it's just stuff. Stuff's replaceable. And I'm like, wow, this is so about 2020. But give us an inside glimpse into how it is really, really part of your family. Yeah, it really is. I mean, um, I grew up in the studio watching my mom teach dance, but also do all the behind the scenes stuff. Um, and so I was getting an education just by observation all those years of my life. And then I went off to NC State for um, engineering. I had an engineering scholarship and went, did two years of that and decided, ooh, this eight o'clock physics class. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I don't know about this. I came back to work a little bit at the studio. And I'm like, wait a minute. I know all this stuff. This is like so familiar. It feels good. It makes me happy. What am I doing with my life? You know, but um, it gets in your blood. And I think that's true of a lot of family businesses, um, you, it feels good and it's so familiar. And then that's what makes me so sad about seeing these small businesses um, go down the tubes is now you gotta jump in to, to uncharted territory. You have to like remake your whole existence and that is so, so hard. Um, I just can't imagine. It's crazy. Yeah. And then, um, you know, I would think the employees that you have, that you have managers because you have different locations and you just can't be there all the time, that these mm -hmm. people, I, mean, I think this would be for most small businesses, they do become like family because you're trusting them with the keys and the money and everything. Right. You know? Yeah. And I, even... Even more so with us because um, a lot of the teachers that we have started taking dance with my mom when they were three years old. Whoa. I mean, I've known these ladies since they were toddlers and now they work for me. So um, we want to be able to help support their families. Mm -hmm. We do everything we can to make the business survive so that their families can have food on the table. That's a big responsibility. Yeah. Yeah, I just think it's a, a beautiful thing. You know, I watch a lot of like Gordon Ramsay shows and one of his shows, it's old, but you know, he goes into failing restaurants and tries to revitalize them. And so many of them are these family businesses. And I mean, people are on the verge of divorce if their restaurant's failing. I mean, you know, kids aren't speaking to their dads and uh, just that silly show has given me such an inside glimpse into what it's like to run a business. I mean, some people are there more than they're at home, you know, I mean, right. it's, uh, I just don't like this whole anti-business climate. And, you know, one of the things that frustrates me is, you know, I kind of run in some libertarian circles and they're all, you know, some people are just so mean on that side, you know, it's like, if they can't survive it, it's like culling the people who can't survive. I'm like, this is all artificial and made up, you know, libertarians are not supposed to be for government intervention where it literally is trying to ruin this person's life, you know? Right. Or maybe they are supposed yeah. to be, but we're real. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're real people. Are. And, Every day we are real. <laughs> yeah. And you know, I, I really should, you know, I feel bad going to the big box stores sometimes and there is a grocery store I go to and I won't say their name. They're North Carolina owned and they're right up the road from my house and they never say anything to me in there because I have three growing boys and I spent a fortune in there. That's probably why they right. 
but I also live out in the county. I don't live it near the city. And um, I think the levels of Karens out here are pretty low. So yes. uh, that's something that, yeah, you have to deal with it when you have a, a business in the city. But I think something that's even more shocking to me is, you know, you see citizens doing this, but you also see business owners doing this, cheering on the closures. Literally people cheering on kind of their own suicide business-wise, perhaps physically. What, what is that about? Do you have any beeline into that kind of thinking other than trying to squash the, the competition? Yeah, that's really hard. Um, I don't know unless, I mean, it has been extremely hard and we're, we're hardy folk <laughs> here, you know, <laughs> and maybe some, maybe some people just can't stand up to the pressure. It has been yeah. a pressure cooker this year for, for our family, for, um, I mean, even dealing with landlords, dealing with lawyers, dealing with insurance people, do things that we never would have had to spend time on in normalcy. Yeah. Um, and so I just wonder if people were over the headache of it all and they were just like, I'm ready to throw my hands up, get it over with, let me out because it was, it's, and it still is. We're still hoop jumping all the time. And I don't know what hoop is coming next mm -hmm. at this point. Um, and some people just aren't set up for that, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but I would never cheer, even if it was a competitor of mine, even if it was, you know, somebody in the same business, I would never cheer, um, a small business going under because that is the stuff of America. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the cornerstone, um, of the whole economy. You know, and a lot of people say that this started from the beginning to kill small businesses, because if you kill that, you kill the middle class. And then you just have, you know, the oligarchs and the poor people and the poor people get the government handouts. And then it's just a symbiotic hellscape, you know, um, right. you know, I kind of feel like that just personally too, not owning a business, but I am on edge all the time just because of hoops. And I don't even own a small business of just going around trying to lead a normal life. And then, you know, you snap at your kids because they spilled their milk or whatever. And like everybody yeah. uh, on edge and it, it, you know, meanwhile, you know, you've got Mr. Monopoly man, you know, with his fancy hat and his monocle laughing hysterically and we're all right. like gnashing our teeth. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, extremely frustrating. Yes. Um, and they're, you know, th today or yesterday when they pass the thing, they think they're helping us. Well, I don't want any of their money. Yeah. I don't want it. Right. I'm, gonna, I just want to work mm -hmm. <laughs> and feed my family. Yeah. I don't want government help. I don't want PPP loans. I don't want grants. I don't want their fingers touching my stuff. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Because it's more than money. And, you know, people who uh, maybe don't have families, people who are single and don't own businesses and, you know, just are floating through life. Maybe that's all they want, but you know, it's about more than that. And I'd written a blog early on about how um, maybe we should stop pulling the cart, you know, like maybe if we all get on the dole, it'll break the system. Yes. But I just, they, they have a way of doling things out that don't benefit maybe people like me either. You know, I just got my whatever $325 it was or whatever North Carolina gave people who had children for to offset educational costs. And I'm like, no amount of money you can pay me would make up for all of this insanity. <laughs> no, right. Right. No. It's Did a, I cash the check? Absolutely. <laughs> it's a slap, but it's a slap in the face. Yeah. And I, and yeah. Yeah. No, thank you. I did, just let me work. Just stay out of my way and let me work and I'm fine. Well, I have a couple more questions for you and then we'll wrap it up. So you've always been a fighter. I know that you have like revolutionary war roots in your family. You're a proud Southern girl. Um, yes. Tell me what you think is the difference between a mandate, an executive order and a law. And sorry, I didn't send you this question kind of in advance to think over it. But to me, like a mandate's like, 
a suggestion. Eh, does, should it really be enforced? Like they're throwing all these terms around. Is that kind of how you're proceeding forward with this? Yes. Um, I feel like a mandate is a suggestion. Like um, you can look at it. This is, this might be a good idea um, for us, for the government to tell you um, to keep yourself, I don't know, safe or uh, those words too are, are kind of nutty. Public health. Yeah. Yeah. But um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I don't look at it as a hard and fast rule. Um, I'm always reading the new mandate with, um, and I've learned how to read them and carefully and find how I can use them to still run my business, to you know, still be able to work and um, not get around. I, I don't want to say get around the suggestions, but work within the suggestions. Yes, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to be reckless, but I'm also not going to be fearful um, because of what they're, passing down the pipe up there out of Raleigh. Um, Cause it's, it's whichever way the wind blows over yeah. there, you know? Yeah. A and they're just pulling stuff out of their hat left and right. Um, depending on the day. Yeah. And you know, this was happening well before COVID, but tyranny of law, there are so many federal laws on the book, just federal, like whatever, like close to 5,000, I think at this point. So at any time, you're a lawbreaker if they look close enough. But mm -hmm. on the flip side of that, I like what you're doing. You're looking close to say, oh, well, I'm not because of this little clause right here. We're doing uh -huh. this perfectly. That's smart. But a lot of people don't have the tenacity for that, just would rather just deal and, you know, right. move forward. And also, I'm talking to lawyers um, about, well, I, I called initially about um, Nancy Vaughn's practice of publish releasing mm -hmm. the list of wrongdoers and then um, and also asked the lawyer about you know what is this journalism outlet publishing it what well, they should be sued for defamation also because the all the claims are uncorroborated uninvestigated yeah um, so I asked him about, you know, going after the mayor, going after the media. And um, it just reminded me of that quote in Atlas Shrugged. I don't have it on me right now, but um, the lawyer pretty much said the media and the government is so protected from being sued for defamation um, that you really don't have, there's no doorway to eek into to get them. Mm -hmm. um and in atlas shrug dan ran says something like um you know when when the laws are protecting the oligarchs and the, the media and the government and they're not protecting you anymore that's when you're in, you're under tyranny yeah and the sad thing about this is there are so many but you know I'm, you know, for decentralization you know which means i don't want washington dc telling me what to do but this is our governor and the freaking mayor, I mean, you can't yeah. get, now, I, I don't answer to the mayor because I don't live in Greensboro, but I do, my, I have doctor's offices there, my husband, you know, would work there or whatever. Uh, I mean, that's as, almost as close to home as you can get. And it's like, man, I want to secede from all you people. Yeah. Jen and I are going to have a commune together and y'all can't yeah. come in. <laughs> We're out. <laughs> but it's crazy. You can't blame Trump for this. I mean, this is... Mm -mm. You know, and uh, I don't know about Nancy Vaughn, but like uh, Cooper, he's a native North Carolinian. I'm like, he should know better, you know, granted, you know, whatever, he's a lefty Democrat, but it's like, these are your people, dude. What are you doing? Yeah. It's horrible. Out of control. The, it's, it's power trip from cities to right up to the state level. It's out of control. And another thing that I don't get about the mayor, you know, she's supposed to be so like chamber of commerce and building business and all this kind of stuff. And I'm not always a huge fan of the chamber of commerce, but if you look at it just like on its basic supposed principles, you know, building business for infrastructure, you know, to provide infrastructure and jobs and clean cities and all this. And it's like, well, I guess you just only want Walmart here. I don't know. 
Uh, yeah. Uh, and that city council, mm, yeah. it's Greensboro's in bad shape. We, if we're being listened to by some Greensboro voters, you guys need to be a close look at next time you go and vote for those mm -hmm. council members and the mayor, because it's super bad. We got to get them ousted. And I have just a, another political question for me, and then I'll wrap it up with two pretty easy questions for you. But one of my shticks lately, and it's not really a shtick, I just see it as kind of the obvious thing to do is, and it's not my idea, I'm just riding on people's coattails, is we have to fix things at the local level and then it percolates up. Like Washington's, we're done. I mean, they're so insane there. I, they're just, we can't even worry about them. But, um, you know, maybe you could run for office. Maybe I could run for school board. Yes. I mean, something where we get these people. Out. I know that I've had ballots before where people ran for a county commission unopposed. These are people, you could be that person, you know, and I'm not pushing it on you. I'm just saying normal people like us who are done with this and realize we can't blame this on federal tyranny. <laughs> um, I think we really need to get involved, at least start going to county commission meetings and things like that. Um, you know, I know way more about federal politics than I do local, so I put myself in this group too, but I, I'm going to change that because, yeah, Nancy Vaughn is yeah. my neighbor, you know, I need to know way more about her. Yeah, it, um, I would like some normal people in, and I, you know, that, that term these days doesn't mean much, so how about I would like some let me let me use a different <laughs> adjective. I would like some reasonable people there or some go. logical people or some people with some down home family sense um, to be making some decisions instead of these yahoos we got over there now. Yeah, because you know we live in a blue county. Greensboro is a uh, blue city, but. I only hang out with conservatives and um, that would go over into Forsyth County too. I have a lot of friends like Kernersville and Winston, but I mean, we are here. It's like, you know, the sleeping giant. I think we just got to get, get off of our duffs. So maybe another silver lining of this is we used to be like, well, we're busy, you know, homeschooling our kids, running businesses, yeah. having babies. Well, now it's like, well, I guess we better do something because this sucks. <laughs> It does. It so does. <laughs> That's the bumper sticker. Do something because this sucks. <laughs> yeah, I like it. <laughs> All right. Well, um, moving forward, um, I know it's hard to plan for anything. In normal life, it's uh, hard to plan for anything. But how are y'all going to kind of forge ahead into 21 to what's your plan for 2021? Um. Yeah, we're kicking 2020 out <laughs> on the 31st for sure. And um, just as far as business goes, we've got to watch expenditures still closely and um, wait for it to build. But I'm, I'm not planning on caving to any of this um, madness because people are coming and people are supportive. And even if I only have... 60 to 65 percent I've got the good ones mm -hmm. I've got the ones that are willing to live life without fear and um, have some joy in their lives again so I'll be glad to provide the best that I can for them going forward and um, you know i I think people can tell by this conversation, you're a very resilient person. Um, I mean, what will happen, and maybe it has happened, what if you get, you know, $5,000 worth of fines or 20,000, because there are 20 people in there and Nancy Vaughn tax on 500 other ones or whatever. Um, you know, what's the plan for somebody like that? Because I think personally, you should not pay. And then we all just go say, she ain't paying, come in and force it. Right. Um, that's what it's going to be because lawyers have told me that, um, again, expenditures on lawyers that I never would have had to make before. Yeah. I'm making 60% of what I would have made, but I've got these added expenditures that I'm having to do because of the crazy, crazy mandates and stuff. Anyway, um, they, I, they would be, um, contested fines would, um, because the, oh, okay. Yeah, because the That's complaints. That's good news. Yeah, because the complaints are made anonymously, 
-hmm. I don't think they have a leg to stand on to find us. So if they tried it, I would contest it in court and they would never see a dime. Now that's the Nancy Vaughn anonymous thing. What if just a cop walked in and said, hey, that 12 year old girl doesn't have on a mask a thousand dollars, right? For the current Cooper mandate. Would the same still, go there? Still contested. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Good. These <laughs> lawyers, I like them. You are getting your money's worth at least. <laughs> yeah, I know. Wow. Well, Jen, it has been a pleasure talking to you and I haven't seen you in so long. Is there anything else you want to say that we didn't touch on? Um, I just, man, I think about you all the time. So I'm sorry we had to come together under these circumstances. I but, know. Um, I think we need to go together face to face and hug without masks on and like fist bump and do all the things we're not supposed to do. I am <laughs> totally down with that. I'm there. Name all a place right. and time. <laughs> Yeah, there are a and few I'm restaurants really... that are very cool about going in maskless. I'll tell you about them. We can meet there for a drink sometime. Yay! <laughs> Yay! But yeah, you keep up the good fight. I always love your stuff, and um, I'll keep up the good fight too, Rebel Sister. All right, man. Thank you so much, and tell the family we said hello, and God bless you. All right, give everybody a hug. I will. Bye bye. Bye.